from the betting capital of the world. Giving raw and real breakdowns of mixed martial arts and recapping UFC events like no one else with producer Martin on the ones and twos and combat sports betting expert Effie. You're listening to Any Action Sportscast. Any Action Sportscast. So put your headphones on and let's take this podcast to the next level. Um, this isn't a podcast. It's a sportscast. What is up, guys? We are back. It's your boy, Effie, with Any Action Sportscast. Here to go over UFC 300, Jamal Hill versus Alex Pereira. Man, I am so excited for this card on Saturday, guys. This is the greatest card of all time from beginning to end. There will never be another card that matches UFC 300. Just bangers on bangers on bangers. And I know bangers. I know, bangers. I am so excited for this card, man. I cannot wait for these fights. And we are coming off a a week where we didn't have a single bet, guys. For the first time in our show's history, we passed on last week's card betting-wise. So our bets went 0-0 without a single bet's place. So, man, I'm ready to fire off on this card. I already have two bets placed. One of them's a huge underdog. And yeah, man, in general, I feel like a lot of these underdogs are going to be barking on Saturday, man. I feel like a lot of these fights are close. You can make a case for a lot of these money line dogs either which way. So I'm super excited to talk about these fights. So without any further ado, let's get right into the fights. And in the very first fight of the night, we have two former champions going at it with Davison Figueredo taking on Cody No Love Garbrandt. Figueredo comes in with a 22-3-1 record, coming in as a minus 300 favorite. He is 36 years old, 5'5", five five, with a 68-inch reach. He's fighting Cody Garbrandt, who comes in with a 14-5 record, currently plus 240 on the money line, 32 years old, 5'8", with a 65.5-inch reach. So right away, we have to talk about the fact that Davison Figueroa comes into this fight at 36 years of age, but also at minus 300 on the money line. A huge favorite, in my opinion. And that sucks because I really am confident that he's going to win this fight, man. I feel like Davison Figueroa is going to finish Cody Garbrandt in this fight. At this point, we all know, you know the type of project we're going to get in Cody No Love Garbrandt. It's his durability that comes into question, man. On the feet, I actually do think that he's going to be winning the minutes in this fight. I feel like Davidson Figueroa is probably going to be the moment winner in this fight, as far, especially on the feet, whereas Cody Garbrandt is going to be accumulating the, the minute winning in this fight. But, man, this strikes me as a fight where Cody Garbrandt could be winning the fight up until he doesn't, man. All it takes is one shot from Davidson Figueroa here, and I feel like the whole entire fight can change. I really worry about Cody's uh, durability in this fight. But at the same time, guys, Davidson Figueroa is 36 years old, man. This guy's had a ton of weight cuts in his career. And, bro, he eats shots a ton. He's very hittable, and he has a, a ton of confidence in his own, you know, durability. And he's willing to get into the fire and, and really exchange in the pocket. And that could really hurt him here in a fighter against, you know, a fight against someone like Cody Garbrandt, who's very elusive, has a lot of good lateral footwork. And he's in and out of the pocket relatively quickly, man. The one thing with this fight I got to mention, though, is I feel like Davidson Fredo can take down Cody Garbrandt in this fight whenever he wants. He's going to be the bigger guy in this fight. This guy was cutting a crazy amount of weight to make, you know, flyweight. And finally, later in his career, he's finally moving up to bantamweight, where he probably should have been the whole time. And it just sucks that he's 36 years old, man, because I'm pretty confident he's going to finish Cody in this fight. I feel like both these fighters are actually pretty content to be counter-strikers. So whoever goes first is actually going to be the fighter that's probably going to get hit, get hit more. I feel like David Severo is going to counter-punch Cody Garbrandt all night up until he finishes the fight. So... For the very first fight of the night, I'm going with Davidson Figueredo to actually finish Cody Garbrandt in that second round. I'm going to go with a ground and pound finish. And up next, man, we have, uh, we have a banger again, man. I'm going to say that for a lot of these fights tonight. We have Bobby King Green taking on Jim A10 Miller. Bobby Green comes in with a 31 15 and 1 record, currently minus 190 on the money line. He is 37 years old, 5 foot 10 with a 71 inch reach. He's fighting Jim Miller, who comes in with a 13 and 17 record, currently plus 160 on the money line. He is 40 years old, 5 foot 8 with a 71 inch reach. And right away, guys, I gotta say, I'm going with the underdog in this fight. I am going with Jim A10 Miller in this fight. But it's gonna be close, man. In theory, Bobby Green should win this fight. I understand why he's a favorite. You know, he's a taller, longer guy, quicker striking, uh, should have a speed advantage in this fight. And in all, you know, reality he probably should win a decision in this fight and there's something that's going into this fight that really has me swaying towards jim miller and that's the fact that bobby green just four months ago got knocked out about four times in a single fight against jalen turner he got rocked put on the ground and then jalen turner goes in for the ground pound finish and for some reason guys the ref 
hates Bobby Green in that fight, and he let the guy take an insane amount of damage, guys. If you go back and watch that finish for Jalen Turner, that's one of the hardest finishes to watch because, man, talk about a late stoppage, man. That dude took some years off Bobby Green's life. I don't know what the ref was thinking in that fight. I don't know why he didn't like Bobby Green so much, but, man, he let him eat some shots. One of those where he obviously totaled up. You know, He's not defending, and he's getting knocked out. And then he's getting come back too. He's getting knocked out and come back too. This guy was getting crushed by Jalen Turner on that ground and pound. And that was only four months ago, man. So that's a very quick turnaround here to have a full camp, to make weight again, and, you know, and to go out there and fight. So that's definitely worrisome, man. That's what he's been receiving a ton of knockouts, losses, I should say, in his career recently. You know, got knocked out by Jalen Turner, finished Grant Dawson relatively quickly. That was a great performance by him. And he took actually some some pretty good damage by Tony Ferguson, a fighter that, in my opinion, was over the hill and washed at that point. And before that, had a, a, head, a clash of heads, a headbutt with Jerry Gordon. That got turned into a contest. And then before that, got slapped by Jim Miller. Or, sorry, Drew Dober. And before that, is on Makachev. So, man, this guy's been taking a ton of damage. He's actually pretty active for how old he is. That's the thing. Jim Miller is 40 years old on the other side here. And, man, it's tough to get behind a 40-year-old. So, I, 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 really, I don't think I'm going to be betting him in this fight. But, man, I think that he's going to catch Bobby Green at some point in this fight. Ever since overcoming Lyme disease, Jim Miller's been looking like a million bucks in the Octagon. Now, I got to say, I got to admit, the level of opponents that Jim Miller is defeating and finishing, you know, on this recent run, they're not as good as Bobby Green. I'll, I'll admit, man, Jim Miller seems to be this permanent gatekeeper in the lightweight division where he's getting a ton of, you know, upcoming prospects who, who have to get tested by a savvy veteran, Jim Miller. But it's funny to see Jim Miller fight these days because earlier in his career, he was more of a grappler, taking guys down, submitting them. Whereas now, it seems that he's found a ton of power in his strike. Man, a lot of confidence in the pocket here from Jim Miller. And yeah, man, I'm going with him to, to win this fight. Man, this guy's fought on UFC 100, UFC 200. Now he's fighting on UFC 300. So an absolute legend. And I'm, I'm sure the whole crowd's going to be rooting for him in this fight. Man, it's going to be a tough test. Bobby Green, in theory, should be able to pick him apart, stay on the outside. But I just think that at some point in the fight, Jim Miller will catch Bobby Green and end up knocking out Bobby Green. So I'm going with two finishes in the road to start the card. I'm going with Jim Miller. I'm going with a third round knockout over Bobby Green. And up next, man, we have a women's fight between Jessica Andrade and Marina Rodriguez. Andrade comes in with a 25-12 and 12 record, currently minus 110 on the money line. She is 32 years old, 5'1", with a 62-inch reach. She is fighting Marina Rodriguez, who comes in with a 17-3-2 and 2 record, currently minus 110 on the money line. She is 36 years old, 5'6", with a 65-inch reach. Now, this fight, I gotta say... Man, I'm torn, man. I'm going back and forth and back and forth. But ultimately, I am going to pick Jessica Andrade to win this fight. I feel like she is way too physical and, you know, imposing of a fighter for Marina Rodriguez to deal with. You know, if I look at Marina Rodriguez, the way she's fighting, first of all, she's 36 years old. So that's worrisome for me right away. It's funny because Jessica Andrade is actually 32 years old, four years younger. But you can honestly say she's probably older in fight years, man. This lady has been fighting the high, highest level of competition in the UFC and MMA in general for a really long time, man. Um, she's taken a ton of damage, a ton of wars. As you can see on the screen, she's two and three in her last five fights. But man, all of those fighters would crush Marina Rodriguez. Tati Tatiana Suarez submitted you know, Jessica Andrade. She lost to Yan Jan Yan, where Yan Jan Yan actually lost to Marina, but you can make an argument that she won that fight. And then Aaron Blanchfield, she took that on short notice, and you know, Aaron Blanchfield would take down and maul Marina Rodriguez as well, because that's the way she loses fights, guys. And that's why I'm picking Jessica Andrade in this fight. Marina Rodriguez, if you put her on her back, she's going to stay there, man. I feel like it's one of those fights where Jessica Andrade could be having a relatively close fight, close round, and then really solidify the round in her favor with a late takedown and just really, you know, taking advantage of that control time. I know recently the refs haven't been, you know, valuing control time as much as damage. But even then, Jessica Andrade gets Marina Rodriguez down. And I think that she's going to elbow her into next week. I just feel like Jessica Andrade was way too, too powerful of strikes for Marina to deal with. Marina is more of a volume striker with no pop on her shots. And yeah, I get that she won against Michelle Watterson in her last fight. But that's... The difference between athlete and, and physicality, Michelle Watterson and Jessica Andrade is just astronomical, man. I feel like Jessica Andrade is going to get on track here. I know she's, you know, in a relatively slump, you know, uh, kind of a rough slump in her last five fights. But, man, I just feel like the level of competition here is just way lower for Jessica Andrade here, you know, whereas she was losing to people like Tatiana Suarez. And I just don't think that that's the same type of fighter in Marina Rodriguez. Marina's going to try to strike in this fight, keep it on the feet for 15 minutes. And even then, I feel like Jessica Andrade can counter with left hook and, and really change the fight for, for her in her favor. So I feel like the powerful strikes are going to be coming from Jessica. The volume probably comes from Marina. But the grappling edge and the ability to get the fight down definitely goes to Jessica Andrade. She's going to be having to deal with a huge disadvantage in the reach and height um, in this fight. A three-inch reach disadvantage and a four-inch height uh, disadvantage as well. She's going to be the smaller fighter here in this fight for sure, but man, she's a little bulldog. I feel like she gets in there tight, gets her down, and either wins a decision or finishes this fight. 
I'm going with the decision, man. Give me Jessica Andros to win a three-round decision, if not finish it late. Up next, we have Jalen Turner taking on Renato Moicano. The tarantula Jalen Turner comes in with a 14-7 and record. He is currently minus 225 on the money line. He is 28 years old, 6'3", with a 75.5-inch reach. He's fighting Money Moicano, who comes in with an 18-5-1 record, currently plus 185 on the money line. He is 34 years old, 5'11", with a 72-inch reach. I feel like it's pretty fair to describe this fight as a striker versus grappler, with the striker being Jalen Turner and the grappler being Renato Moicano. And I feel like that's fair because Renato Moicano is going to be wanting to take the back of Jalen Turner. He's going to want to get this guy down and now grapple him in this fight because if he stands at range for 15 minutes, there's just no way he's going to win this fight. Jalen Turner is a very sophisticated, very quick, very tall and long, dangerous striker, man. This guy is six foot three, fighting at 155. Just madness. Um, 75 and a half inch reach, unreal. I know it's only three inches longer of a reach for, for Turner over Moicano, but man, just watching their frames, watching them fight, he's going to be huge in this fight. And we've seen Renato Moicano hurt and put down in his fights. And we've seen his striking defense fail him in his fights. Bro, Jalen Turner gets put down. I don't know if he's going to get up against Renato Moicano. I feel like that's a pretty open and shut case where Renato Moicano is going to be looking to utilize that grappling, looking to close distance and get this guy down, get that body lock, get that trip, and, and really put Jalen Turner on the mat and keep him there where he's most you know, safe. I feel like he's going to have a tough time closing that distance. I feel like Jalen Turner should be able to pick apart Renato Moicano as he's trying to come in. And I feel like Jalen Turner is actually live to finish this fight at any moment or win a decision. So I know Renato's getting up there in age 34 years old. Super durable, man. In that RDA fight, the ref could have called him multiple times, but he showed heart and he stayed in there all five rounds on short notice against someone like RDA. But man, I just feel like this is a tough challenge for Renato Moicano. That frame and size is going to be tough to deal with. That speed from Jalen Turner is going to be tough to deal with. I'm going with Jalen Turner to win this fight. I think he's going to win inside the distance. Give me Jalen Turner to win via knockout in that second round. Up next, we have a banger. This time in the featherweight division, we have Super Sadiq Youssef taking on Diego Cut My Life Into Pieces Lopez. Sadiq Youssef comes in with a 13-3 and record, currently plus 115 on the money line. He is 30 years old. 5'9 with a 71 inch reach. He's fighting Diego Cut My Life into Pieces Lopez, who comes in with a 23 and 6 record, currently minus 140 on the money line, 29 years old, 5'11 with a 72 and a half inch reach. And man, you can definitely go either way in this fight. And I feel like there's definitely a good case to bet on the underdog here at plus 115 on Sadiq. But I'm actually going to go with Diego Lopez in this fight. I got to say, though, guys, I do not love that minus 140 price tag next to him. I do not like betting juice, betting chalk t t for him to win this fight because it should be a tough, tough test for Diego Lopez, man. So first of all, Sadiq Youssef definitely has the experience and has way more you know, UFC high-level experience than Diego in this fight. He's coming off a loss against Edson Barbosa where, man, he was looking good earlier in this fight, but he definitely faded, definitely, you know, had a huge cardio dump, adrenaline dump in that fight, and Edson Barbosa came back and put it on him bad. Um, He had Sadiq rocked all over the octagon in that fight. Um, It was a crazy, crazy fight, so he's looking to get back on track against the up-and-comer where, I mean, this is the UFC looking at Diego Lopez and putting him on a huge favorite and be like, all right, dude, let's see what we got. Let's see where we are with Diego Lopez because, man, this guy came in on short notice, fought... You know, Mazvar Evoliev in that fight, who now looks like a championship contender, uh, you know, a top one, two, three contender in the division. And he almost submitted the Russian Mazvar Evoliev, but we all know that dude doesn't tap and he will never tap to anything. So Diego ended up losing that fight, but he had that guy's knee shredded to pieces, man. Um, I can't believe that to this day, Mazvar didn't tap. But that's what the thing with Diego, man, this dude has crazy, crazy elite jujitsu. He comes from a crazy jujitsu background, but his striking, man, isn't bad, man. This guy throws everything to his shots. He has heavy hands. Um... A lot of volume, man. This guy is kind of reckless on the feet. He's just going forward, pushing the pace because he wants to grab you. He wants to get you down. He has extreme, supreme confidence in his jiu-jitsu, whether it be off his back or offensively trying to get you down. Um, Sadiq Yusuf, though, should have the answers to keep this on the feet. I don't think that Diego Lopez is going to be able to take down Sadiq Yusuf in the open mat. I feel like the body locks are going to be have, how he's going to have to get the fight down, especially in the clinch along the cage. But, man, Sadiq Yusuf... He'll be able to win the minutes here as long as he doesn't, you know, blow his load in the very beginning part of this fight, which I don't expect him to do. I feel like he learned his lessons from that last fight against Enzo Barbosa. But, man, um, this is going to be a close fight, guys. Uh, one of those fights where this is probably my lowest, you know, confidence uh, type pick, you could say. I'm going with Diego Lopez here, man. I do think that the, the hype is real with this kid. I feel like he can utilize his striking to, to really get to that, that body lock and get Sadiq down or at least, you know, grab him because... Just because he doesn't put him down on the mat or if Sadiq gets up, as long as Diego is just on him, man, I'm going to be feeling pretty confident that he's going to win the fight. It be a great, great fight. A huge test for the up-and-comer Diego Lopez. But, man, I think he, he has enough, man. I'm going with Diego Lopez to win that fight. I'm going to go with a three-round decision. 
Holly Holm taking on Kayla Harrison and welcoming her to the UFC. Kayla Harrison finally making her UFC debut, and I can't wait for this one. So we have Holly Holm coming in with a 15-6 and six record, currently plus 340 on the money line. Wow. She is 42 years old, 5'8", with a 69-inch reach. Kayla Harrison, you know, the two-time Olympic judo champion gold medalist, coming in making her UFC debut finally after all these years. She comes in with a 16-1 and one record, currently minus 480 on the money line, 33 years old, 5'8", with a 66-inch reach. So how could you not be excited about Kayla Harrison finally coming to the UFC, you know, after all the type, you know, all the talk, all the, all the hype and stuff. She's finally making it, man, and Holly Holm's going to be the one that welcomes her. But right away, guys... What are we doing? Minus 480? No way, man. I feel like if you're out there parlaying Kayla Harrison, you should definitely go watch her fights, man, because she is not looking minus 480 in some of these fights, man. You're telling me she can't finish Aspen Lad? What are we doing, man? Like, I've got to say, I will defend Kayla a little bit here. She's been fighting in fights where she's not allowed to elbow you, which is absolutely mind blowing. It's crazy to me that the PFL doesn't allow elbows. But she was, you know, in that organization, you know, collecting wins, collecting a million bucks every, every time she won the women's tournament. And, yeah, man, I feel like now that she's going to be able to utilize that part of her game, especially in the clinch, you know, the, the, the judo, judo medalist, um, it's going to do wonders for her. But, man, she is going down to one, I think, 35 in this, you know, in this fight. She has never weighed below 155 in her fight. So, apparently, she's saying, you know, that she can handle the weight cut, you know, and she's not going to have a problem. She's done test weight cuts uh, for this weight, you know, to be on this card or whatever. Man, I feel like that's a huge risk, man. You're, you're betting, you know, minus 40, almost minus 500 on a fighter who's never made this weight cut professionally, you know, and then fought the next day. It's one thing to make the weight, but it's, you know, another thing to come back the next day and, and still look good. And as far as striking on the feet, I'm definitely giving the advantage to Holly Holm. The speed advantage definitely goes to Holly Holm, and just the technique and the variety you know, of strikes definitely goes to Holly Holm. Kayla Harrison just pots forward those one, two simple jabs because she wants to grab you. She wants to clinch you and judo toss you into the sky, you know, and then put you on the ground and dominate you. You know, I love me a good Uchi Mani throw. It's my favorite thing to watch in the UFC and MMA in general, I have to say. Man, I just feel like there's going to be a lot of cage pushing in this fight, which is kind of the type of fight that Holly Holm has been fighting recently. And a lot of, you know, Time spent close together in close range. I don't feel like a lot of this fight will be taking a uh, place on the feet at distance because then I would definitely give the advantage to Holly Holm. But I do feel like Kayla Harrison is going to push this girl back on the winning track, you know, get her down or at least get her in the clinch. And from there, you know, really rack up some control time and eventually get this fight down at least once every single round. But man, I am not parlaying minus 40 on Kayla Harrison. No way, man. You have to be able to make that weight. You have to come out the next day and look good. And you have to have, you know, a ton of finishing ability to, for me to, you know, believe that's going to happen. So maybe Kayla Harrison can, you know, head and arm throw Holly Holm, you know, and get her down, get a, get her arm bar or something. That could happen. Man, I am just not that confident. Minus 480 on Kayla Harrison. I want to pick Holly Holm, guys. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I'm talking about this fight. I really do want to pick Holly Holm. Well, I'm not going to, man. I'm going to stick with Kayla Harrison in this fight. I just got to say, guys, I can't say enough. I disagree with that minus 480 money line. But I will go with a second round submission for Kayla Harrison. Up next, we have a, a featherweight fight between Calvin Cater and Aljamain Sterling, a classic striker versus grappler, with the striker being Calvin Cater and the grappler being the former champion in Aljamain Sterling. Calvin Cater, man, comes in with a 23-7 and record, currently plus 120 on the money line. He is 36 years old, 5'11", with a 72-inch reach. He's fighting the former champion at bantamweight. Coming up to featherweight for the first time, making his debut at 145, Al Jermaine the Funkmaster Sterling, who comes in with a 23-4 and four record, currently minus 140 on the money line. He is 34 years old, 5'7", with a 71-inch reach. So yeah, man, let's, talk with, uh, let's start with Al Jermaine Sterling. So he's the former champion coming off getting knocked out by Sean O'Malley in that second round of that fight. He's 34 years old, man. He's getting up there in age, and he's going to make that weight cut, you know, enough times now over and over again. That weight cut was really getting to him. He's a big guy, man. He's a big dude to be making, you know, bantamweight. And the way he fights, man, he's not the prettiest on the feet. He doesn't have the best technique, you know, kind of plus four or five footed. But, man, once he grabs you, once he takes your back, that body lock, that triangle he has, man, it's fierce, man. He's He can, you know, rack around, can really dominate around off one takedown, or he can get that rear naked choke submission, you know, off that, you know, that back take. So, that's what he's going to be looking to do in this fight. He's going to be looking to get Calvin Cater down, um, obviously, because on the feet, Calvin Cater is going to smoke Aljamain Sterling. Man, I'm pretty confident that on the feet, Calvin Cater is going to pick apart Aljamain Sterling pretty badly. And I'm picking him, man. I'm going with the underdog in this fight. The, the What really sucks, man, I wish we could get a better scenario. The facts are the facts, man. This guy is 36 years old, coming off a pretty significant knee injury where he and also a huge layoff, man. This guy hasn't fought in forever. He threw that kick against Arnold Allen in his last fight a year and five months ago, right? So almost a year and a half where he hasn't fought. And he, he tears up his knee, has to get surgery. 
But bro, like if that didn't happen and if he wasn't this old, I feel like this line would be a pick 'em or if not, Calvin Cater would be the favorite because we had never seen Alderman starting at one forty five. We don't know how his cardio is gonna look. We don't know how the power is gonna, you know, you know, carry on the feet, but we don't know how he's gonna be able to take a punch. We don't know how that durability is gonna look, and he just got knocked out viciously against Sean O'Malley. I feel like Calvin Cater is gonna be able to faint enough to keep Alderman Sterling from diving in on that knee, you know, and, and eating a punch on the way in. And really making him think and be hesitant. So I know Alderman Sterling is out there predicting himself a second round submission. But I'm going with a Calvin Cater first round knockout, man. I think that he's going to knock out Alderman Sterling. And if not, just pick him apart for three rounds and keep this fight upright. Everyone knows into this fight what the game plan is. Alderman Sterling is going to be diving at the legs, ankle picking, doing anything he can, desperately trying to get Calvin Cater down because on the feet, there's just no way he can keep up with Calvin Cater's technique. Calvin Cater's jab is one of the best in the UFC. Um, ask Max Holloway. But yeah, man, uh, this dude's striking is very good, man. I really like that handsome Calvin Cater. He should have the volume. He should have the power. He's a, a, a bigger guy, the more natural 145-er. Give me Calvin Cater, man. Give me Calvin Cater to win this fight and actually finish Aldermaine Sterling. Go with a first-round knockout. Oh, my gosh. And this next fight is chaos, man. Up next, we have a light heavyweight fight between Jiri Prohoshka and Alexander Rockage. Prohoshka comes in. With a 29 4-1 record, currently plus 110 on the money line, he is 31 years old, 6'3", with the 80-inch reach. He's fighting Alexander Rockage, who comes in with a 14-3 record, currently minus 130 on the money line. He is 32 years old, 6'4", with a 78-inch reach. So an inch taller for Rockage with a 2-inch shorter of a reach. Yeah, man, this fight's going to be chaos. And if you're out there betting Jerry Prohoshka at plus money, I don't blame you, man, because this guy is live to finish the fight at any single moment, man. 29 professional wins, 28 knockouts. Kind of crazy. This dude, when he touches you, man, people go out bad. And on the other side, if you're betting on Rockets at minus 130, I don't blame you either because it's like if you watch Prohoshka, this dude doesn't do anything. Like, this guy has no defense. His hands are low. He throws wide. He throws wild. And for somehow, it, he just makes it work for him. Um... I'll be honest, guys. Jerry Prohaska does not check leg kicks. If you throw 10 leg kicks at him, they're all going to land clean, and he's just going to keep going forward and maybe switch stance every now and then, but he's going to keep forward and eat him, trying to, trying to kill you the whole time like a Terminator. Um, he doesn't have the best striking defense. Like I said earlier, his hands are low. His hands are by his nipples. Um, it's just not pretty. It's just not pretty at all to watch him fight, but just that, that he overwhelms guys. He throws from weird, awkward angles. He has weird movement. He's like Tony Ferguson on steroids. Like, this is crazy watching him fight. Um... There's no real reason to pick him, man. I, I'm going with Rockage in this fight. I mean, it's just so crazy because this guy is coming off of a huge, huge layoff. This guy hasn't fought a long ass time. Let's see how long it's been. A year and 10 months. So he heard got hurt in that fight against Jan Blachowicz where he threw in the leg kick you know, and, and shattered his, near, his knee towards ACL a bunch. Had to get crazy, crazy surgery. Comes back. He's actually scheduled to fight Jan again. And Jan ended up being the one pulled out. So this dude hasn't fought in forever. He actually had a fight you know, scheduled, which does make me feel a little bit better because he, that means he was in camp, had a full camp, and was ready to fight. And now this is his second camp post-knee surgery. But he himself, man, he's, uh, he's kind of low output. He doesn't have enough volume for me to be really confident in this fight. And he's pretty basic, man. He's pretty simple with those ones, too. Simple low leg kicks. Um, he's going to be slamming the lead of Prohoshka. If Rakic comes out here and doesn't, target the leg of Prohoshka right away, in my opinion, he's dumb. Like, you need to come out there and, and just slam that lead leg of Prohoshka and really limit the mobility of him and the quickness and explosiveness of Prohoshka because that's how he fights, man. That's how he needs to win. And if you just slow him down, I feel like you can catch this guy. I feel like Rockets can back this guy down and really land a big shot. So going with Rockets here, I'm not crazy confident. I, I do understand why that line is so close. It should be a pick in my in my eyes. So the fact that you're getting plus 110 on Prohoshka, that's not a bad bet. You know, uh, he lost against Pereira in that last fight, but I feel like that was a... a Bit of a quick quick stoppage and he had a crazy crazy fight with glover to share where i can't believe he submitted glover to share but you know it just feels like you know, glover was like a thousand years old in that fight but yeah man i'm going with rockage in this fight pro hoshka definitely has a chance to win especially as an underdog i'm sure his knockout props are, are pretty nice if, if he's an underdog straight up on the money line so yeah give me rockage so i'm signing with the guy i feel like he's technically cleaner and, and the better overall fighter in MMA than Prohoshka. It's just that the Prohoshka is a madman, guys. I can't stress that enough. This guy is live to finish the fight at any second of the fight. If you're betting on Rockets, man, you're going to be sweating the entire time. So give me Rockets to win this fight. I'm going to go with a first round knockout. And up next, man, Bo Nickel takes on Cody Brunish to open the UFC 300 pay per view card. This will be the first fight on the pay per view. And it should be an absolute slaughter. I'll be honest. Bo Nickel comes in undefeated blue chip prospect, three-time national wrestling champion at Penn State. He comes in with a 5-0 undefeated pro MMA record. He comes in as the biggest favorite in UFC history at minus 2,500. Absolutely hilarious. He is 28 years old, 6'1", with a 76-inch reach. 
He's finding Cody Brundage, who comes in with a 10 and 5 record, currently plus 1,200 on the money line, 29 years old, six foot tall with a 72 inch reach. Now, I'm picking Bo Nickel, guys. I'm not going to sit here and pick Cody Brundage, but man, you got to be crazy <laughs> to parlay or bet, you know, obviously not going to minus 2,500, 2,500 on Bo Nickel. I'll say, guys, no human should be minus 2,500 against another human in the UFC. I don't care who it is. This is, this is ridiculous. This is MMA. Anything can happen. Have we seen Bo Nickel take a punch? No. I mean, on one side, that's good. That shows that he's dominant. That he has really good striking defense. Obviously, he's not getting hit. Like He's just going out there and molly whopping people. But at the same time, how do we know that this guy's not going to crumble on the very first shot he takes? Like He's even tweeting himself, man. There's a 100% chance I'm going to get hit. Or I think he said like 99. There's a 99% chance that I'm going to get hit for the very first time at UFC 300. And Cody Brundage is going to go for it, man. I got to say, I'll say it right now. If Cody Brundage pulls guillotine, if he tries to pull guillotine and jump gu gilly on Bo Nickel, he is the dumbest fighter to ever exist in the UFC. Um, if Cody, because he has a real problem doing it, this guy uh, jumps guillotine in all of his, not all of his fights, but in a lot of his fights, it's a really bad habit of beating the clinch on the cage, getting pressed, and then going for that guillotine, ending up on bottom in a compromised position. Um, I mean, guys, pulling guillotine rarely works, man. Dustin Poirier does it all the time. He doesn't have one single guillotine submission ever in his life. So I don't know why people like doing this so much, man. People think they're Charles Oliveira, Brian Ortega. Those guys, uh, they can totally do it. Like, I don't care. Go ahead. Go for it. But Cody Brunage is not that. He's not some sort of elite jiu-jitsu you know, specialist or anything like that. He's a pretty mediocre wrestler that has some powerful hands that's fallen in love with his hands who's not that good. There's a reason why they're giving him, you know, Bo Nickel in this fight. The UFC wants him to lose. But, man, go back. I, I can't believe I'm going this long on this fight. But go back and watch Bo Nickel's last fight against Val Woodburn. Val Woodburn's about 5'5". Five five. You know, he's a midget for the weight class. And he was coming in on a week's notice because Trayshawn Gore pulled out. And Bo Nickel shoots a takedown and gets stuffed by a guy that's 5'6 on a week's notice. Like, that was crazy. Like, we're sitting here talking like Bo Nickel's actually, like, some sort of like, insane, you know, takedown artist. He actually has a pretty bad takedown percentage in the UFC. A lot of these guys are stuffing that initial shot. And, you know, I'm just not sitting here thinking that he's going to go down, take Cody Brunson's very first chance, and then, you know, tap him out 35 seconds later. Who knows? Maybe that might happen, but, man, like, I don't think it's going to. I think Cody Brunson's round one knockout, play, you know, five bucks on it, do ten bucks on it. Like, it's that's some crazy, crazy outcome that can probably happen, man. And in that fight against Val Woodburn, Val Woodburn throws an overhand right and almost knocks out Bo Nickel, misses this by that much, and he's so short that he couldn't reach Bo. Bo pulls back, head in the air, feet super close to each other, and then he, you know, ends up knocking out Val, but, you know, Man, I, I'm just, I can't believe this line. I can't believe how confident people think Bo Nickel is going to come out here and, and dominate this fight. At some point, we're going to see Bo Nickel take a punch. So I'm going with, I'm going with Bo Nickel. Uh, I really want to bet and pick Cody Branch, but I'm not going to. But give me Bo Nickel and be careful if you're out there parlaying him and putting a ton of money on him. Next, we have a banger of a fight. My favorite fight of the entire night. We have Charles Dubronx Oliveira taking on Armin Tarzukian. Charles Oliveira comes in with a 34 and 9 record, currently plus 185 on the money line. He is 34 years old, 5 foot 10 with a 74 inch reach. He's fighting Armin Tarzukian, who comes in with a 21 and 3 record, currently minus 225 on the money line. He is 27 years old, 5 foot 7 with a 72 and a half inch reach. So I mentioned it earlier in the show in the very beginning. I already have two bets, and my first bet of the card is on Oliveira in this fight. I took Charles Oliveira for 1.25 units at plus 195, and it was funny because when I went to open it, put the bet into my app, he was actually minus 200. I logged in, and by the time I refreshed and tried to put the bet in, he was plus 195. So I kind of got screwed a little bit on that price, but I'm happy to have a, a ticket on Oliveira at plus 195 because I just feel that that line is crazy, guys. Earlier this week, Armin Tarzukian was minus 240. That's a 70% winning implied probability and i just feel like if you think out there that he's going to win this fight 70 percent of the time i gotta disagree i feel like this is more of a 50 50 fight a 55 45 fight closer to a pick em. And i feel like there's a ton of value at plus 25 on Oliveira. listen i get it this guy has super bad striking defense and super he's super vulnerable on the feet to get clipped Armin Tarzukin has very crisp and underrated striking, man. We saw him against Benil Darius in his last fight. And, you know, in other fights, honestly, in the UFC, where his striking is deadly, man. This guy is powerful with those really quick jabs, really quick left hooks, and a super fast high head kick. And the way he did Benil Darius was pretty dirty, I'm not going to lie. I honestly thought he won this fight against Matuas Gamera. I had a ticket on him, so maybe I was just looking through my glasses, you know, trying to hope for my bet to win. But... Man, I feel like he did enough to win that fight. I feel like the judges didn't really score that spinning back fist knockdown that he had in that fight. 
man, this guy's grappling is elite. I gotta say, though, the one thing that worries me in this fight when I was watching tape, Joaquin Silva on about a week's notice on short notice rocked and hurt Armin Tarzukian, man. Armin Tarzukian was hurting the, uh, got hurt in that fight and started doing the chicken dance in the octagon. But I will say, to his credit, a young fighter in that moment, right? He's supposed to, he's rising, he's ascending. He's coming off a, a, a low-key robbery two fights ago, and he recovered well in that fight. So on one hand, yes, it is bad luck that a guy on short notice was able to get up as many times as he did, like Juan Kim Silva, and actually hurt Arun Tarzukian on the feet. That isn't the greatest look. But I will say, I will give him credit on the other hand, because he did show good durability, good heart, and good focus to come back in that fight and end up dominating that fight. So... You know, it was just one of those things. Armin Tozukin has very good wrestling, right? Very good ground pound, very good top control. This guy's scrambles are unreal. He's honestly probably the second best or third best grappler in the division right behind Islam Makachev. But the thing is, he's going up against Charles Oliveira, who, in my opinion, is safe in every single area of this fight. If Armin Tozukin goes out there and can get Charles down, which I don't think he will. I think he will be able to get Charles down. You know, and this turns into a 15-minute striking fight. I'm taking Charles Oliveira, man. He has very good Muay Thai, very good knees and elbows. Um... And this guy is quick, man. Justin Gaethje said he was the hardest guy he's ever been hit by. When he got hit, his you know mouth felt like a battery or something. Something crazy. Like this, this dude has serious, legit fight-ending power on the feet. And if Armin Tozukian takes him down, Charles Oliveira has some of the best jiu-jitsu and best reversals in the entire M MMA game, man. Like this guy is legit on the ground. Like I'm just, I'm not worried about Charles really anywhere in this fight. I just feel like if this goes all 15 minutes, then that means that Armin Tozukian really controlled Charles and kept him down and pinned him for most of the fight. I do see Armin Tozukin having more of a decision winning equity than Charles if it does go off a team, but I don't think it will. I think Charles Oliveira finishes Armin Tozukin in this fight, just like he does in most of his fights, man. This guy's finishing Justin Gaethje, Justin Poirier, Michael Chandler, but don't doubt Rush. I mean, what do you want this guy to do? How is he plus 195? Like, what are we doing? So give me Charles Oliveira, man. I feel like this line is way off. I feel like money's going to be coming in on Charles throughout the week. Uh, man, he's 34 years old. You know, he's quite hittable and he's quite susceptible to be taken down. But I feel like he's going to have you know, be hungry for that rematch against Islam Makhachev, which he earned, by the way. The only reason he didn't fight is because he got hurt. So he was right there for another title shot. So I feel like this, I know, you know, I get the feeling of it just might be Armin's time. I've been, you know, calling for him to be a future champ for the longest time now. But I just feel like Charles Oliveira is a tough test, man. Give me Charles Oliveira to continue this old vet, you know, performances like Dustin Poirier against Ben Not Saint Denis and to, to show this young buck what's up. So give me Charles Oliveira to win that fight via second round knockout. And up next, we have the BMF title up for grabs. We have Justin, the highlight Gaethje, taking on Max Blessed Holloway. Man, I can't wait for this fight. So, yeah, man, uh, two Hall of Fame, future Hall of Famers in this fight. We have Justin Gaethje taking on Holloway. Gaethje comes in with a 25 and 4 record, currently minus 210 on the money line. He is 35 years old, 5 foot 11 with a 70 inch reach. Fighting Max Holloway, who comes in with a 25 and 7 record, currently plus 175 on the money line, 32 years old, 5 foot 11 with a 69 inch reach. So, quite a bit of money now coming in on Holloway, pushing him down to around plus 150, plus 145 on my books. And so, a lot of people are you know, taking the chance to take big underdog price on Holloway. And I've been torn on this fight, man. I've been going back and forth. I really wanted to pick Holloway and possibly bet Holloway in this fight because. This will be the second time, you know, recently in his career that he's been fighting at 155. He fought Dustin Poirier, you know, a few, uh, not a few, a, a while ago, few, like, I think about four years down. And yeah, man, and then he goes waiting, went back down to 145, ended up, you know, having that trilogy with Alexander Volkanovsky, a couple other fights. And it's just one of those things where Max Holloway would definitely be champion if Volkanovsky was never around. It was just one of those things where that was the guy in front of him. And it's so crazy because Volkanovsky, you know, beat Holloway, became champ, defended it all these times. And now he's not champ and he's kind of on his way out. And Holloway is still here, man. He's guy's still 32 years old. Absolutely wild how young he is. I feel like a lot of people don't give him enough props for how good he is in the all-time greatest fighter rankings because I, I really respect the, the skill set and the career he's amassed so far from Holloway, man. This guy's fought high-level competition. He's beaten the who's who. He's been in the who's who. And he, yeah, man, he's so, he's so competent everywhere. Really good takedown defense. Obviously, really good striking. But he's fighting Justin Gaethje, man. And I feel like at 155, he just won't be able to eat the shots coming from Gaethje, you know, at, as he does at 145. At 145, Max Holloway gets bailed out by his chin all of the time, man. This guy gets, eat, you know, eats big shots in a lot of his fights. And if he just has that granite, you know, Hall of Fame iron chin, and eventually that's going to go, man. I'm not saying it's going to go this fight at 32 years old, but Justin Gaethje, man, is not the type of guy you want to be in there with for five rounds, you know, taking his best shots. And one thing I really like from Gaethje in this fight is going to be slamming that, that lead leg from Holloway. Holloway is super heavy on that front foot. And if Gaethje can either use outside or inside leg kicks, he's going to chop down Max pretty bad, in my opinion. It's just one of those things where Max could probably win the minutes. He's probably going to be getting ahead on volume, getting ahead on the on the stats. But every single shot that Gaethje lands should be more significant than Max's. I know Max is looking good, you know, filling out at 155. 
But man, I, I feel like he's going to you know, have this fight and then go right back down to 145 and challenge for the belt against Ilya Tapuria. I mean, why wouldn't he? He's kind of in a win-win spot. If he wins, great. He's going to be ranked at the top five at 155. And he loses. It's not the biggest deal because he's at 155. And he's still the top contender at 145 with a new champion. He hasn't fought yet. So I'm going with Justin Gaethje, man. I feel like Justin Gaethje is actually going to finish Max Holloway for the very first time. I don't know if he's going to knock him down or just get the fight called on the feet standing up. But I feel like those slamming lead leg kicks are what's going to really make the difference in this fight. Eventually, he's going to get to Max. One thing that I really like for Max in this fight, though, is that his ability to work the body you know, should be huge in this fight. Um, it's a five-round fight, so Justin Gaethje is going to have to you know, pace himself for five rounds. Whereas that's, that's never been a problem for Holloway. I'm not saying it is for Gaethje either, but... I mean, Max has really good hooks to the body, really good team kick to the body. He's a really good leg kick and a knee push too as well, John Jones style. And to, to really keep Justin at bay. So I'm interested to see how Max approaches this because I feel like he's going to be working the body a lot early, really depositing those shots in, in the beginning of this fight. Hopefully they pay off later. But I don't think they will, man. I think that Gaethje eventually catches him and, and really cuts him up, man. Max Holloway has a ton of scar tissue on his face and he cuts up pretty easily at this point in his career. So give me Justin Gaethje to win this fight via knockout in that fourth round. Up next, we have a women's strawweight title fight. We have Wei Li Zhang coming back, taking on Yan Zhan Nan. China on China, man. A prehistoric fight. Two Chinese fighters fighting for the belt. Pretty awesome, man. Um, we have Wei Li Zhang, the you know defending champion, coming in with a 24 and three record. Currently minus 420 on the money line. 34 years old, five foot four, with a 63 inch reach. He is fighting Yan Zhan Nan, the number one contender, who comes in with a 17 and three record. Currently plus 320 on the money line. 34 years old, five foot five, with a 63 inch reach. So pretty similar frame here in this fight, same age. And yeah, man, usually when you know we get to the title fights in the UFC, I don't care who you are, man. It's really hard to justify being this big of a favorite and this big of an underdog. You know, we're at the highest level of MMA. Both these fighters are obviously super skilled and super experienced. So you would expect Yan Zhan Nan to put up a pretty good fight and really you know make those odds look pretty stupid. But not this time, man. I'm going with Wei Li Zhang to really dominate this fight. Yeah, I'm you know, I'm not actually, you know, that worried about this money line. I actually feel like she's a pretty big favorite for a reason. I feel like that's justified. I feel like the the big thing with this fight is on the feet, it's pretty close, right? Uh, it's you know, honestly closer to 50-50 on the feet, which you wouldn't want, you know, in a fight where one fighter is minus from 420. But once it gets to the mat, once the grappling is initiated in this fight, it's gonna look night and day. Wei Li Zhang is honestly probably gonna molly wab on Zhao Nan. When she gets this fight down to the mat, I feel like Yan's ability to get taken down is just so high. And Wei Li Zhang will be stupid not to, you know, utilize that game plan. I feel like it's going to be a lot of forward pressure from Wei Li Zhang. She's going to have to step into the fight because Yan Zhang going to stand her ground. Um, she's not the best fighter off her back foot. But she has very good striking, game, very crisp, very good, you know, shot selections from Yan. I really like her, man. It, it's kind of tough because we've been on her, you know, previously in her, in her UFC career. She's cast for us, you know, many times. And she's a good fighter, man. It's just that I feel like this is one of those things where there's just two different levels in athletes in this fight. I feel like Wei Li Zhang is just way too physical, way too fast and strong. And that grappling disparity is just way too big. I feel like she does cover this price once this fight gets down. Um, and she does whatever she wants, man. She's going to be able to pass Yan at any moment in this fight. It's so crazy to me. I believe it was the like Carla Esparza fight where Yan Zhanan actually almost armbarred herself like from bottom. Like it was insane. I don't know what she was doing. Um, but yeah, man, the, the grappling disparity is just so big in this fight where it's going to make up for how close it is on the feet. Yan's best chance in this fight is to really mark up Whaley and cut her early in this fight and really have that last throughout the whole fight because I don't expect her to, to spend too much time at range in this fight. I just feel like she's going to be able to let level change in this fight, get to the hips and get her down. If not, push her against the cage and use that uh, body lock trip. So I just feel like the strength from Whaley is just too much. The skills from too much from Whaley, the volume, the output, the, the durability. I mean, she's a terminator, man. She's getting up there in age at 34 years old, but she's here to stay as champion, in my opinion. Give me Whaley Zhang to dominate this fight and actually end this fight inside the distance with some brutal ground and pound from Crucifix. I'm going with a third round finish. And now it's time for the main event for UFC 300. Guys, do me a favor before we get into this fight. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Let me know what you think about the video so far. Do you agree? Do you disagree? A lot of these fights can go either way, man. I feel like you can defend you know, a lot of these fighters with which either fight you pick, man. Um, so yeah, man. So without any further ado, let's get right into the main event. We have the light heavyweight belt up for grabs when we have Alex Poetan Pereira taking on Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill. Neither fighter has lost their belt at uh, 205, and it's going to be interesting, man. So we have Alex Pereira coming in with a 9-2 record, the champion. Coming in at minus 150 on the money line, 36 years old, 6'4", with the 80-inch reach. He's fighting the former champion who never lost his belt and had to vacate due to injury, Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill comes in with a 12-1 record, currently plus 125 on the money line, 32 years old, 6'4", with a 79-inch reach. 
man. I can't wait for this fight because there's going to be a lot of questions answered. You know, the UFC was kind of scrambling for a main event for UFC 300, and I feel like this wasn't their first choice. I feel like Jamal Hill isn't ready for this fight. I feel like they rushed him and gave him, you know, a huge amount of money to take this fight because it is a huge risk. The reason I'm bringing that up is because he had a Keely surgery, you know, about a year ago, and I feel like that's just way too quick of a turnaround to have a pretty significant injury, you know, especially when you need really bad in fighting, uh, you know, especially with footwork and, and obviously rebalance. Um, I think he was coming back against such a dangerous striker in Pereira. But it does kind of remind me of Tom Aspinall. When Tom Aspinall fought Sergey Pavlovich on a week's notice, I was kind of sitting there thinking, like, this is a you know, terrible situation for him to be in. And he's probably going to lose. And sure enough, he goes out there and wins, man. Sometimes these fighters, you know, come up, you know, they step up to the plate and, and they hit a home run in the biggest spots of their, in their life. This is a huge opportunity for Jamal Hill. And let's go into the fight. So the way the fight's going to play out, obviously two strikers. Neither fighter here has a takedown in the UFC. Neither is going to utilize that grappling. And if it does go to the mat, I'll be super interested to see who, who has an advantage because I just don't foresee either guy really, you know, going for that. If anything, it'd probably be a desperation clinch attempt or something like that. But man, I feel like most of this fight is going to be tested on the feet here. So in that scenario, I would have to favor Alex Pereira. Alex Pereira, obviously the glory kickboxer that, you know, had a crazy kickboxing experience. Be, is, he, is he out of Sanya all those times? But man, I said it when I picked against him the second time against uh, Adesanya, where Adesanya got the knockout. He is, he's freaking hittable, guys. He's hittable with simple strikes, like simple one-twos down the middle. Um, Pereira, you know, doesn't have the best head movement. He's just potting forward because he wants you to come forward, and he's going to, you know, really catch you with that left hook and, and really <laughs> annihilate anyone that, that eats that shot. You know, Pereira's left hook, that check left hook, will sends people into the shadow realm. Jamal Hill... He's gonna be have he's gonna have to be safe, man. He doesn't have the best footwork. He doesn't have the, the best lateral movement, but he has a ton of volume, guys. This guy will be going forward, pushing the pace, pushing the fight, the whole fight. And I feel like if he can really get in the face of Alex Pereira, he's gonna have success landing because, like I said, he doesn't have the best striking defense. It's just because Alex Pereira is so deadly of a, a lead leg kicker. I really think that's gonna hurt Jamal Hill. I am picking Alex Pereira to win this fight, but I am worried he's gonna get knocked out, man. This guy is 36 years old, and he I, I worry about his durability. I do question how good his chin is, but I will say. I had more of those questions, and I felt like more bad about it, worse about it, when he was at middleweight, not too, not light heavyweight. At light heavyweight, I feel like this was way better for him for that wake up for his brain, his rehydration. I feel like he's way more durable and, and he has way more of a, an ability to take a punch at this weight class than that middleweight because he was cutting so much weight. So that is, you know, going good for him for sure. But man, Sweet Dreams hasn't fought in over a year. He's coming off an Achilles tear. And I'll be honest, guys, I don't want to you know talk crap about the guy, but if you look at his run, you can definitely poke holes in it, man. Uh, OSP at the time, you know, he's super old and watched. I believe he was like two and three in his last five fights. Paul Craig actually beat him. And then Jimmy Crute, not in the UFC. Like, he's cut now. Johnny Walker, one of, you know, one of the more senior guys in the UFC. Uh, he's still in the UFC, but man, first round knockout over a senior guy. Tiago Santos in the PFL fell in drug test these days. You know, got that knockout as well. Uh, and then Glover Teixeira was 50 years old and he couldn't finish him in that fight. So, man, I, I mean, I just don't know, man. Whereas Alex Pereira was fighting the who's who, he's fighting former champions, he's fighting Hall of, future Hall of Famers. I mean, give me Alex Pereira to win this fight. I think he's going to knock on Jamal Hill. I don't think he goes all five rounds. And I feel like it's going to be super exciting. But I wouldn't be shocked to see this young up-and-coming guy, you know, two former champion, I shouldn't even say up-and-comer, this young guy, you know, in his prime, you know, win this fight in Jamal Hill. But I don't think it's going to happen. I think Alex Pereira wins this fight. I think he wins via brutal knockout. I feel like those leg kicks are going to pay, you know, dividends, especially early in this fight. And I can't wait, man. I can't wait for this fight. So, yeah, give me Alex Pereira to win this fight via knockout. That'll do it, guys. That'll do it for my UFC 300 video. Super excited, man. Let's hit 300 subscribers, man. Hit that subscribing button, and we can hit 300 because, man, we've been stuck at 290 for about six weeks now, six months, something like that, something crazy. So let's get those numbers up, and let me know who you have in the comments because this is such a good card. Man, every single fight, you can make a case for every single fighter. I haven't seen a card this good in all my years watching UFC, and I cannot wait, man. Do not miss this card. Do whatever you have to do to watch this card. And thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you guys next week. Good luck on your bets. Peace.